This is our last Sunday of the Get Going series, and in your bulletins for the last four weeks, you've had one of these uh, inserts. If you don't get a bulletin on Sunday morning, you can go grab one. There, there's a stack of them out there, and you'll have this insert on the inside, and there's areas to sign up, and we've had a lot that have turned in their sheets over the last four weeks. Really, our goal as we connect, grow, and serve at Mulder is that everyone is serving in some way. And so we've got a lot that have been turned in. We've got a lot more to come. And you notice Celebrate Recovery is one of those on there that you can check. There's some other ministries, some that we're looking at getting started, like the, the helping shut-ins in our community, those the those less capable ministry, and other areas that we've emphasized throughout this series. So I encourage you to, to turn that in uh, before you leave today. There is also the prayer guides that uh, Justin mentioned earlier as uh, we're, we're wrapping up. This series this week, next Sunday, we're starting a new series as the new school year kicks off in August, and uh, you don't want to miss next Sunday in this series. I'm really excited about it. Don't feed the trolls, okay? You're like, what does that mean? Some of you know what that means. Some of you, maybe you don't know what that means. Um, it's going to be really relevant, let's just say that, and, uh, and I think it's going to be kind of fun. So uh, I hope you'll be here um, starting the new series starting August the 4th, next Sunday. So... Most of you probably are like me. Um, you grew up in an environment that generally being Christian was kind of assumed. If you're an American, you're a Christian. That uh, that's, We're in a Christian culture, a Christian nation, and at least that's sort of our foundation of where we come from. And while maybe one, everyone around you doesn't live that way or that's generally accepted, if they're going to check the box on what religion they are, they will check Christian. And part of that is because of our background. We grew up in an environment. We, we grew up going to church or we had a grandmother that went to church and who told us about the Lord or prayed for us. Um, we, maybe we, we sang some of the hymns growing up. You didn't know exactly what they meant. You know, some of the lyrics were kind of like, what does that mean? But you learned how the hymns went. And, and maybe you didn't keep the Christian morals, but you knew what they were. At least uh, when I was in high school, some of the Biggest hellions in my high school class, you know, they had grandmothers that told them about, they believed the end of the world was coming, that Jesus was about to come back, and I guess it didn't affect how, uh, it didn't affect how, I didn't say just them, us, how we were living um, in those days. And so, uh, maybe, maybe for many of you like me, you came to faith later in life, but that foundation was there, you had it sort of drilled into you, or it was generally sort of accepted, but that is changing, that is changing. And the world's changed a lot in just 20 years since I was in high school, 25 years since I graduated high school. And uh, some of you, that wasn't your experience. You came from a background where there were not Christians when you were, where you were growing up. Maybe you were an atheist or you didn't know anything about the Bible or anything about Christian teaching, and you came to faith later in life. And we have some stories like that in our church, and I'm so grateful for those stories. And maybe some of you feel like you're still on the outside looking in. And if that's the case, I'm so glad that you are here today. But for most of us, growing up in Alabama, we're in, there's a reason they call us the Bible Belt, okay? There's a reason why there's a church on every corner, and not every corner, but almost every corner. And then on the other corner is the place where everybody that left that church when they got mad went and started their own church. You know, there's, there's churches all around. But once you leave here, once you leave the Bible Belt, you see how things are changing. They're changing. And it's beginning to change here, too. Slowly, not suddenly, but it's changing. There's more apathy to not just Christian belief, but religious belief in general. I think a lot of this is a result of 9-11. What happened after 9-11, people blamed religion on what happened, just sort of blanket all religion. Okay, there were some writings by some atheists, some key atheists that came out the last 10, 15 years. Okay, and not just where there's apathy, that there's a point that there's a hostility toward Christian faith. And it used to be where, like, you had um, generally Sundays were a day that most businesses were closed. Well, that has changed. And now most businesses are open on Sunday. And there used to be a time to where sort of based the ball season, at least there was ball tournaments and things, they would make sure that you were home on Sunday because Sunday was not just a day to worship, but a day to rest. Um, and Wednesday nights were generally kind of respected 
by other, especially around here in the Bible, but that is increasingly changing as well. And what's happening is that it's kind of a slow drift. Nothing, no cultural change happens suddenly, but then one day we, we wake up and think, how did we get here? What happened? It didn't happen overnight. What happened was that we got out of the habit. We got out of the habit. It's easy. One thing leads to another. How often do you say it's so easy to get out of the habit? And then I thought, well, you know, it's just I haven't been in so many weeks. And then if I go back, everybody's going to say, where have you been? Where, what's wrong with you? And I don't want to talk about my problems. Or they're going to ask me, how am I doing today? And I'm really struggling. And I don't want to have time for superficial conversation. And maybe I'm not really sure if I believe this anymore at all. I've just been reading all these other things that question what I believe. And, and so we just drift away. And what happens is, is that our children, if we have kids, or those who come after us, they see our example of dwindling participation, getting out of the habit, and that's all they know. So they, they follow that example. And maybe they even take it a step further. Before you know it, what's happened is that within maybe one or two generations, that foundation that have been laid for you, that have been passed down to you, it ends with you. It's not passed on. And so within a relatively short period of time, an entire culture abandons its foundation. Now, I'm a pastor of a church, so Christian church, so it would be natural that I would say that I would grieve over this, and I think that it is not good that we as a culture are losing our foundation because the things that we value as a nation, as a society, as the Western world, things like respecter of the individual rights and belief in things like equality and justice and respect for authority, all of those things are based on eternal foundations. There is eternal foundations. There's a reason why we believe all people were created equal is because there is a creator. There's a reason why we believe in respect for authority because there is a higher authority that we must all answer to and we believe in justice because there is a right and a wrong. There is a moral law because there is a moral law giver and what happens is when we get unmoored from the foundation we don't know where we might go. And this is why it's so important what our habits are. Because habits reinforce your beliefs. And they influence the heart. Now for a lot of people, the changes in our culture, particularly with respect to religious belief and Christian faith, it's really interesting when I answered the call to ministry 20 years ago and was becoming a pastor. I had a lot of people who I grew up knowing me and, and they kind of wondered what I would become. They said, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you for doing that. And I was like, thanks. You know, I, was like, I didn't do this so you'd be proud of me, but thanks. But then I had other people, friends, who were on the, the border of, of belief, really maybe even were outside of Christian belief, were like, what the, fill in the blank, are you doing? You know, what are you thinking? Thousands of dollars, engineering education, to become a pastor, and today, the latter reaction is becoming more and more a response than the former. Why would you want to do something like that? And even becoming associated with Christians can create a, sto a social stigma, okay? Well, if that's disturbing to you, if that might even be scary to you, and I think fear is increasing a reaction among Christians in our culture. I think that's, we kind of feel like the slipping away from us, you know, it, we kind of the way that things used to be is changing. And there's a fear because we recognize that our world is increasingly urbanized and pluralistic. I used this statement last week 
in describing how the early church and their, their, the world that they lived, that it was increasingly urbanized. More and more people lived in cities, and there were the diverse belief systems, pluralistic. People could kind of believe whatever they wanted to believe. There was a lot of different belief systems. You had, you had the, the Buddhism of the eastern part of the, of, of the former Alexander the Great Empire in India. You had like the, the Greeks had their religion, the Romans, which it was developed from. You had the Egyptian gods. You had a lot of different belief systems. Then you had the Jews and the Christians. There was this pluralistic, uh, pluralistic religion. But instead of being afraid, the early Christians were very bold. And they went out and they changed the world. And so if, if our reaction is to be afraid, I think maybe that isn't the right response, especially in light of Jesus' teaching to his disciples. Because when Jesus sent his disciples out after his death and resurrection, he had no credibility. I mean, there were no general respect for Sundays. You know, they didn't generally, businesses didn't close that day. There wasn't a, a general understanding of the rights of all individuals and a sense of equality. There was, there was no credibility. Okay, there was no general influence to talk about someone named Jesus with, with the wider culture. And certainly no strategy on how we are going to co-opt Rome and Roman culture and make it Christian, even though that's what happened within 300 years. There wasn't any kind of strategy for that. Instead, they just obeyed Jesus' teaching. He said, therefore, go and make disciples. Go. All authority has been given to me, so I want you to go and make disciples. What, I, what you are doing, which is you are my disciples, you are learning from me, you are following me, my teaching, you are soaking it in, you are trying to obey that teaching. I want you to help other people, in fact, the entire world to do that, to make disciples of all nations. That's what I want you to do. You are to be on the offense, in another way to describe it. You're not to be afraid or scared on defense. Go make disciples of all nations. And they'd just seen Jesus crucified and raised from the dead, so they were motivated, okay? They weren't scared. And here's this disciple making. It's going to have two prongs to it, at least, at least in the, what Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. It says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's the... The rite of initiation, that's the, 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 the uh, sacrament of uh, becoming a part of the, the family of the church, of the Christian family, which we look at it as, as more than just a rite, that is something that's sacred. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them. Now, today, when you look at this, you look at baptizing, that's what happens when a person becomes a believer in Christ, they accept Christ, they become a Christian, they put their faith in Jesus, they repent of their sin, they turn to faith in Jesus. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. And we look at baptism as that's really sort of, it's become institutionalized in a sense that you expect a pastor to baptize those who've been given authority by the church or by somebody else, or maybe they just claim that authority, but somebody who has the authority, given that authority by their congregation or whatever, somebody who has that authority to baptize. In the United Methodist Church, it's given by the larger denomination to those who are ordained elders or priests or local pastors or given the responsibility to baptize. We expect somebody who's got credentials, somebody who's been trained, somebody who knows what they're doing. At least that's the way that the church is structured this. And we often assume the same with the second part. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And So we expect credential people to baptize, and we expect credential people to teach. Why? Because we don't know what we're talking about, right? We don't know enough to teach. Teaching is scary. In fact, there's places in the Bible where it says not many of you should be teachers, and teachers will be judged more strictly or more harshly. So we'll let you teach, okay? You've been to seminary. You've paid all that money. You've been ordained. You can do all that. And so I'm going to let you teach because if I were to teach, I might teach something wrong. In fact, I probably would teach something wrong. And you're right. You probably would, which this is okay, which I probably teach wrong things. So something None of us are like 100% right all the time, okay? There's a lot of different ways different scriptures can be interpreted. But we associate teaching with imparting knowledge. It's about knowing more. 
It's about knowing your Bible more. It's about knowing the story more. And, and, and there's a lot of truth to that. There's a lot of truth to that. And, we, and that's why a lot of times teaching, we think of teaching, especially in Sunday school classes and, and even in sermons and things, is that it's helping me to know more and I want to learn. And that's a great thing. But did Jesus tell his disciples to teach them so they may know more? Is that the goal of teaching? That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, don't teach to know. I mean, a lot of times we kind of associate, that's what it's all about, knowing. It's about ideas and what's in your head, knowledge. Jesus didn't say, teach them to know. He said, teach them to obey. And there's one thing to know something. There's another thing to do it. There's another thing, one thing to know what you should do. And there's another thing to actually doing it. And a lot of times it's so easy to make our faith like that. If it's in a group, we, we make it all about ideas and I, I like to think about the or, or what, what do I know or what I don't know or what some other person, some big idea about politics or what's going on in Hollywood or some religious zealots or whatever. It's a whole nother matter when it comes down to my life and whether or not I am obeying Jesus. I mean, what Jesus is saying here really is the goal of your teaching, the goal of making disciples, once someone has made the profession of faith, once they've entered into the family, they've accepted Christ, praised God, gone from death to life. I mean, that's huge. But the goal of the teaching, after that, the goal is to get into the habit to get into the habit of obeying Jesus. And we see those Christians, those, those disciples, they went out and made disciples who made disciples who made disciples. And that's exactly what they did. In fact, they didn't grow the church. They didn't add disciples by having some grand strategy or having some program that we're going to invite people into to go out and pass out tracts or whatever that it was. They grew because people saw there was something different about their way of living, their habits. They had been taught to obey Jesus' teaching. So what were those habits? They were extraordinary. They were different than really anything that the ancient world had seen at that time, at least a lot of the people in the Roman world. What were the habits of the first Christians? Well, they, they took Jesus' teaching literally. They were generous. They gave freely. I mean, Jesus said, don't uh, store up treasure for, on yourself for earth where moth and, rust, uh, moth and rust can destroy and thieves break in and steal. But store up treasure in heaven. They were generous. They, they gave freely. And that's because they, they valued every human life, not just the life of those in their community who they gave freely to and they supported one another, but... They valued the life of every human being. It was a custom in the Roman world in that day if a child was born and the parents didn't want it or if there was perceived that there was some kind of weakness in that child or maybe they want, even if they wanted a boy and they got a girl, even something to that place, they would actually do something that would, they would leave the child they would, on a post. They would tie the child to a post and leave it, the newborn baby, until it died. And this was appalling to the Christians. Because they believed that all human life was a gift of God. And so not only did they preach against this, not only did they preach the value of life, what they did was that they would take the children and raise the children. The parents don't want them. We will take them. We will raise them. They practiced generosity. They shared freely. And, and they didn't just value life. I mean, they, they lifted up those who were generally rejected by society, those who are marginalized, the poor, those who are di from different ethnic classes. Women were valued as equals in the Christian community. They weren't in the broader culture. They were generous. And as a result of that respect for life and that Jesus said, if someone strikes you on the one cheek, turn the other as well. 
They practiced nonviolence. They, they lived that. And that created, it created a dilemma for those who were coming to faith, some of whom were in the Roman military. And that created a dilemma for them. And there were different ways that the church community handled that. Some were like, well, you can stay in the military, but you can't do violence. And some were like, and then it was just kind of a, how do we deal with that? That was part of it because nonviolence was their practice. They were also a community of forgiveness and reconciliation. Jesus said, if, if you come to worship and you've got, I mean, this is in Matthew chapter 5. If, if somebody, remember somebody's got something against you, you go back and you make it right. And then you come back and worship. And they treated that literally. Like if you weren't reconciled with somebody, if you were at odds with somebody, you needed to make it right before you come back and offer your gift. Forgiveness. And sexual morality, okay? It's the reason why I put that one last. You know, you, you, once you hear that one first, maybe you don't think about anything. But sexual morality, their sexual ethics were different. Okay, in that day in Roman culture, a, a man, a woman was expected to be faithful in marriage, but a man could kind of do whatever he wanted to outside of marriage. Different sex partners, you know, different, even with children. And Christians followed the example set from the Jewish tradition that Jesus didn't deviate from, that God created marriage. A man should be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. And then Jesus added something else to it. It was like what happened was that people were getting certificates of divorce. There's a place in Deuteronomy that allows that. But they were just doing it just to divorce whoever they wanted to, because the woman had no rights in any of this just to put her away and marry somebody else. And Jesus said, if you do that, if you get a divorce and you marry somebody else, you've committed adultery. And then he even took it a step further than just putting away your wife and marry. He said, if you even look at a woman to lust for her, you've committed adultery in your heart. Wow! Jesus took the original teaching and he made it he took it to another level. Now, I think, I mean, this is even just four of them, but they committed to regular meetings. They certainly committed to understanding the Scriptures and the story and teaching that. But I think we got a lot of work on just right here. I mean, I don't know what you think. And it's not like it's limited to whether you lean left or right politically. I mean, this, this applies to everyone. We've all got room to grow when it comes to obeying Jesus. And so what if we took the Great Commission, that part in Matthew chapter 28 where Jesus says go, and that's been our theme verse for this series. What if we took that literally, not just in going and making disciples and baptizing, but that we made the heart of our instruction, our teaching, was all about obeying. That, that the focus of our teaching what if the teaching, our teaching was focused on keeping the habits? In fact, that's what Jesus said when he says obey, teach them to obey. Actually, the Greek word there is to keep. Teach them to keep what I have commanded you, what I have told you. What if our teaching was focused on keeping the habit of obeying Jesus? And what we're seeing is that in some of our grow groups, this is exactly what it's about. It's so easy for some of us, including myself, kind of to make our discussion all about ideas. Here we read a book, and, and here's what this person says. What do you think about that? Instead of getting to a place where we specifically ask, how is it with your soul? Have you been keeping the habits of obeying Jesus this week? Because habits influence the heart. What you do influences who you are becoming. And not the other way around. Sometimes we think it's the other way around. But it, it works both ways. John Wesley was a founder of the Methodist Church and he believed that. In fact, every renewal movement that we see in Christian history has always been a goal to get back to keeping the habits. And what John Wesley said, the early Methodists, they made what was called general rules. And they had three specific rules. And it was to do no harm, to do good, and attend upon the ordinances of God. And then underneath each of those big three, do no harm, do good, and attend upon the ordinance of God, were like specifics. In do no harm, one of them was, was a prohibition, this was over 200 years ago, of holding slaves. 
But you were not to have slaves if you were going to be a believer, specifically a Methodist. <laughs> drunkenness. Okay, one of them was against drunkenness, was doing harm. Another was po- storing up treasure on earth. Okay, that's one that we can unpack. And then when it came to doing good, there was things like making sure that you are you helping to feed the hungry, visiting those who are sick in prison, those kinds of things, doing good, and attending upon the ordinances of God, regular meetings, okay, coming to church, going to regular meetings, okay, attending upon prayer, study of the Scripture, all of those things, communion, all of those things. It was all about the habits. So what if our teaching was focused on the habits? Because, see, this is why you can't just have church in the tree stand, okay? This is why you can't just have it at the lake, have your little devotion, open up your Bible, that's it, you know? And if you, I understand if you're on vacation. I think we still try to go to church when we're on vacation, but I understand, you know, that is the case. But that's why it doesn't replace it, because you can't do this by yourself. I can't do this by myself. I need other people to help me to make sure I'm keeping the habits. Other people who are on this journey with me, sometimes we fail. We don't always succeed. The grace of God sustains us, upholds us, praise God. It's not depending upon how good we are. It's depending upon how good Jesus is and what he's done for us. But that's no excuse to continue to live in sin, our life in disobedience. That's why we need each other. That's why we have groups. That's why we have grow groups. That's why we have groups that meet for this purpose. And we're looking at launching some more in the near future. In some Sunday school classes, this is their focus. But our goal is is keeping the habits. And this is what's so beautiful about the Celebrate Recovery ministry. And Richard shared his story. He talked about an addiction to gambling. But it's not just for people who have addictions. Okay, the the hurts, habits, hang-ups. Every one of us could benefit from something like Celebrate Recovery. Because you get together and you focus on the habits. Here's where I failed this week. Here's where I succeeded. How can you help me? And I want, next time that we meet, I want to have done better. Not because God's going to love me more if I do good. No, but because I know God loves me and I want my heart to reflect his heart because habits influence the heart. So, I believe that 20 years from now, and that's part of our Renew campaign. We started our prayer initiative last week, and in a few weeks, a couple months, we're going to be meeting in focus groups to talk about the future of the church. And I believe in 20 years... The Christian community is going to look different. It's going to look different than it looks today. And uh, that's as a result of the culture changing. And and I believe that in 20 years, we will be more intentional of making disciples because we can't take anything for granted. And you look 20 years down the road, and who's going to be the adults in 20, 30 years? It's going to be our kids, okay? Okay. I might be here 20, 30 years. I might not, you know. Jesus may come back before 20 years. So, praise God. We may all just be in heaven, you know. But we're making plans at Mulder. Because it's not just about habits for us. It's about habits for our kids. And the kind of world that my children are growing up in is drastically different. I wouldn't say drastically, but it's a lot different than the world that I grew up in. There's a lot more things that are out there for good or for bad. So in February, we're having our first parenting conference. February 7th and 8th, mark your calendars. Parenting conference, and uh, what I've discovered is a parent of three under four, okay? Our our oldest turns four on Tuesday, so I can't say that for for one more day. But um, I've learned, you know, kids don't come with instruction manuals. How do you deal with technology today? How do you deal with discipline? How do you, how do you, how does that, how do you deal with your own marriage relationship in light of all of this? And and so that's what we're going to discuss. Our our, our keynote speaker will be Dr. Den Trumbull. He's a pediatrician in Montgomery. He's written a book, Loving by Leading. And then we're going to have some breakout sessions where some 
parents from our church who've raised some outstanding kids are going to be given some, um, given some break, some teaching, and then we'll have some other, some other um, people who are teaching breakout sessions and with different focus, but, but uh, looking at the future. And uh, so mark your calendars for those, those days. It'll be a Friday night and a Saturday in early February of next year. Because uh, when it comes to our kids, and you don't even have to have kids, it can be any other, it can be anybody who's, who's following in your footsteps. If we want to inspire them to keep the habits, we better start living them ourselves. And the best way to model that or to encourage them to do that is to model it, is to keep it yourself. Yes, it does matter. They are hearing what you say, but even beyond that, they are watching what you do. Because the truth is, we don't grow before we go. We don't grow and then we go. No, we grow as we go. They learn to obey in lots of ways. Not primarily but what we say, but what we do and where we go. This was the way it was with the early church. They saw their habits. They saw how they lived. And they wanted to change. In two weeks, a new school year starts. Not this coming week, but the week following. So a lot of focus on education, school supplies. You see them on, in stores. You go, they are on sale. We are in the learning mode, okay? First day of school, everybody's going to be lined up, all the cars ready for class. They'll be there 30 minutes early, and then by the last day of school, everybody will be 30 minutes late. You know, that's just like the way that it works. But you are ready. You are in learning mode, okay? And as we're learning, who are we learning from? We are all following someone's footsteps. And someone is following your footsteps. So, whose footsteps are you following? Could you make the decision today to get going? That I'm going to get going in following Jesus. In living by the habits. Recognizing I need help, that I can't do it on my own. But I want to get going. And not in teaching and learning to obey. And we all need each other's help on this journey.